Well, welcome to Clinical Problem Solving. Um, my name is Catherine Lucy. I'm the Vice Dean for Education and a Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. And we're going to be spending the next six weeks together learning about how doctors make good decisions when patients present with complaints and concerns. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge the work that I've done over the past decades with several important colleagues, uh, Frederick Williams, uh, Cynthia Ledford at The Ohio State University, and Judy Bo Bowen um, at Oregon Health Sciences University. Now, um, as we think about this course and who it's intended for, I have to say that we originally designed this course for residents and medical students uh, and for faculty physicians interested in improving their skills in teaching clinical problem solving. But the concepts of this course are relevant for all health professionals. Uh, so if you're involved in the diagnosis and treatment of patients, you will find this course useful. Now, importantly, each module they're going to present over the next six weeks will build on the previous module. And while we'll do a brief review at the beginning of each module, it's very important that you stay with us and equally important that you keep notes on the cases that we'll be talking about because you'll see our patients again and again. Using a medical textbook is going to optimize your experience in this class. The prerequisites were that you should have some baseline understanding of medical terminology and have participated in an introductory physical diagnosis course. The textbook Current Medical Diagnosis and Treatment has been used throughout this course to provide information on medical facts uh, and observations, and you may find it useful to use as well. It's been edited my, by my colleagues at the University of California, San Francisco, Maxine Papadakis, Stephen McPhee, and Michael Raybal. Um, this textbook is not required. You can use any medical textbook that you might uh, find useful or have on your shelves. And I do want to uh, note that I get no royalties or compensation for the use of this book. Importantly, um, please keep a record of the work that you're going to do in this class. We're going to revisit patients um, and principles often, and you'll find it useful to refer back to your earlier thinking about specific patients and their complaints and possible diagnoses. Clinical problem solving is fundamentally about helping patients, patients who come to us with concerns, um, symptoms, signs, um, and worries. And it's up to us to help them understand what might be going on uh, and to restore them to health by making an accurate diagnosis and then starting appropriate treatment. What I'm going to be asking you to do in the homework, so you might as well get started now, is think about the next patients I'm going to introduce you to and begin to jot down some ideas about what might be causing the concerns that they're presenting with. You don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but I'd like you to at least begin to activate your brain and think about the patients we're about to meet. Jeremy. Jeremy is our first patient. He's presenting to you in your outpatient practice and he's 15 years old. His complaint is, I have a very sore throat. He's been sick for about three days and is wondering what might be done to help him feel better more quickly and return him to health and back to school and his sports activities. Ms. Sophia Ballara is also presenting to your outpatient practice. She might see you as a uh, physician in internal medicine or a physician in family medicine or even possibly in emergency medicine. Her complaint as a 17-year-old soccer player is that her ankles are really sore and she's had difficulty walking for the past three days and she overall doesn't feel very well. So think a little bit about what might be going through your mind as the cause of Sophia's complaints. Mrs. Garcia is a bit older and she's presenting probably to her internist office, but again, she might present to an emergency department office or if she's getting primary care through her gynecologist, um, any of those physicians might be responsible for evaluating her complaint. She's 59 years old, uh, runs a McDonald's, and has a complaint that she's been getting short of breath for the past month, and in fact has seen two other physicians who've given her early diagnoses and treatment for those diagnoses, and she's still not feeling any better. So she wants to know if we can help her with her symptoms. Mr. Durrett is already in the hospital. He's 85 years old and just had an aortic valve replacement. And this chief complaint comes not from Mr. Durrett, but from his wife, who when she arrived to visit him tonight found that he was confused and not acting like himself. She's very worried and wants us to help figure out what's going on because he had been doing very well up until today. Mrs. Triglione is also a hospitalized patient. She's 48 years old and was initially hospitalized for shortness of breath two days ago. 
seemed to be doing better on the treatment that we prescribed, and we'll get into that later, but now has a complaint that's new. She's terribly dizzy and nauseated and having difficulty functioning in the hospital. And she'll want us to help figure out what, whether this new complaint is related to her existing problem that required her hospitalization. And finally, Ms. Alicia Joan Toppers uh, is 35 years old, and her chief complaint is that she has a stomach ache, and this has been happening to her regularly over the past uh, many months, and finally is tired of it and wants us to do something to make it go away. Those are the patient, patients we'll be working on uh, in the next six weeks, and we will be doing a combination of in-class work and out-of-class work to help solve their problems. We'll revisit them frequently. And this is the goals we have for the current module. First, to describe the differences between knowledge structures of people who are novice or beginner in clinical problem solving and those who've developed expertise who might be known as master clinicians. There are some new terminology we're going to be working with in module one. Uh, and this terminology will carry us along throughout the six weeks. The term illness script will become very familiar to you, and we are going to help you identify the core components of these very important packages of memory. We want you also, by the end of Module 1, to have fully embraced the fact that learning to compare and contrast the critical features of different diseases is really essential to accurate and efficient clinical problem solving. And finally, in Module 1, we're going to talk with you about a mechanism of reading that facilitates the development of expert problem-solving capacity. It's very active reading might be different than what you've been doing, but we believe that using this style of reading for the rest of the course will help you um, assimilate the rest of the concepts that we'll be talking about. So what is clinical diagnosis? Clinical diagnosis is the process by which clinicians obtain information from their patients, history, physical exam, sometimes blood work or other tests, compare that information to the physician's understanding of different diseases, and then develop a working diagnosis that can drive testing and treatment plans. Now, sometimes clinical diagnosis process requires multiple cycles of iteration until we get it right, but essentially these are the elements. Obtaining information, comparing it to what we know to be true about different diseases, and then using that information to develop a plan to help the patient uh, regain their health. Clinical diagnosis is very, very important. Uh, accurate diagnosis is the key to identifying the treatment that will restore the patient to good health. And while computers have been successfully able to generate lists of possible diseases when different signs and symptoms are input into their search engines, the computer's ability to prioritize uh, a disease likelihood based on the patient in front of you is very limited. This is a job that still only the clinician's mind can accomplish. So computers have not yet um, taken this away from us. And despite the widespread availability of diagnostic tests, um, most experts estimate still that history alone, an accurately taken history, um, can lead to the correct diagnosis in the vast majority of cases. Some say as much as 75% of cases. And when you add physical exam to that, uh, an additional 15% of cases can be diagnosed. So just using the skills we'll be teaching in the next six, six weeks, you'll be able to go a long way towards identifying the right diagnosis that will help you identify the appropriate treatment plan for your patient. Furthermore, even when tests are needed, the significance of their results cannot be really understood unless you know how likely it is uh, that the disease in question is present before you obtain the test. And this will be the focus of one of the later modules for this course. Let me give you an example, though, so uh, you can appreciate this concept and uh, use it to stimulate your learning over the next six weeks. So Mrs. Jones Hoppers uh, was one of the patients that we presented to you earlier. Remember, she's a 35-year-old woman who is complaining about recurrent stomach pain over the past several months. The first physician who saw her just obtained a CT scan, which showed a right adrenal nodule. And after extensive workup, this was found to be a non-functioning adenoma with no treatment necessary. And we were no closer than uh, we were at the start to understanding the nature of her abdominal pain and yet we had spent a lot of money and a lot of time of Mrs. Hopper on a test that was not indicated based on the information that was provided uh, in her history and physical. Now, good clinical diagnosticians, those who are really expert in their field, um, know how to efficiently obtain enough information from the patient to make an initial differential diagnosis. Um, this can't happen over hours and hours. You have to do this fairly expeditiously. 
They know how to search their memory or resources to identify possible causes of their patient's symptoms. Not everything will be stored in your brain, but you should be able to understand and identify quickly resources that will help you uh, translate the patient's symptoms into a working diagnosis. Importantly, we will teach you how to do what expert clinical diagnosticians do, which is prioritize the likelihood that a possible disease explains a patient's concerns. It isn't particularly helpful to generate a laundry list of possible diseases uh, and then test progressively for them. It's expensive, it's wasteful of time, and it often um, doesn't get you where you need to be. We want you to learn how to judiciously use tests to evaluate your assessments and continuously revisit the patient's symptoms and signs as you gradually obtain more information about what might be causing the patient's problems. This all seems quite mysterious, actually, when people watch it from the outside, and often even faculty watching students and residents struggling with clinical problem solving are somewhat perplexed as to what's going on in the person's mind. After all, we can see the input. We can hear the history, we can hear the physical exam, we can see the lab tests that people were thinking about as they began to analyze the patient's problem. And we can understand by listening what people think is going on with their patient. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes they've taken the, the initial input and something has happened in their brain and they've gotten the uh, appropriate output, the right diagnosis. But we don't really know that unless we can understand how the brain works well. For instance, if you get an accurate diagnosis after putting in this history and physical information and, and using your existing um, knowledge to solve the problem for the patient, how do I, as the faculty member, know whether that was because your thinking was right or whether it was a lucky guess? Sometimes both uh, things happen in individual uh, physicians and clinicians. Perhaps even more problematic is, what happens if you get the wrong diagnosis? What happens if I hear you take an accurate history and physical and you come up with a wrong diagnosis? How is it that I can go back and help you work your way through a logical strategy for problem solving that will make it likely that you obtain the correct diagnosis not only for this case, but that you learn to do so for subsequent cases? That's the focus of our work. How many of you, either as young physicians or physicians in training or faculty watching physicians in training, have seen this happen? The medical student or the intern goes into a patient's room, spends two or three hours taking an extremely detailed history and physical, doing maneuvers that the faculty physician might have forgotten even exist on the physical exam. And when they come out, they really have no clue as to what might be going on with that patient. Then in walks the attending physician, asks a couple of pointed questions, and arrives somehow miraculously at the right diagnosis. This is the paradox of the clinical problem solving um, expertise development. As you gain expertise in clinical problem solving, your diagnostic accuracy increases while the amount of data you gather decreases. We'll be talking in this course about why this happens, but we can thank George Bordage and Mario Lemieux for the work that they've done to show us that this is what happens with expert clinical problem solving. It's not that experts gather more data, they gather better data. And knowing how to gather better data is the focus of this course. So quiz number one, compared with novices, experts, one, make diagnoses more quickly but make more mistakes, two, make more accurate diagnoses with less data, or three, make more accurate diagnoses because they collect more data? The answer is number two, make more accurate diagnoses with less data.